All right, welcome to lesson four. Here we're going to understand and apply uh, what's called the first derivative test, and it's going to lead uh, enable us to identify the extrema of a function. So to get started, let's consider this function f here. Uh, it's defined on the interval from a to b. Given the function f, explain why c sub 1, c sub 2, and c sub 3 are critical points. Then go through uh, b, c, d, and e. Uh, you don't need to copy down these questions, uh, just answer them uh, on your own. Um, that way you can uh, be as efficient as possible. Okay, so the key here is going to be this sign chart that you are creating. Um, notice that uh, all of those C values are critical points because at those points the derivative is zero. And we can tell by looking at the graph of F because at these particular points uh, we should see that the slope is zero. And I tried to make that as obvious as possible. So constructing my sign chart, I have all the critical points. I've labeled that um, at those particular critical values, the derivative is zero. And now I'm going to determine the sign in between. This is going to help me determine the intervals of increase and decrease, of course. So to the left of uh, critical point one, we can see that the slope is positive. Um, in other words, the function is increasing. In between uh, the first critical point and the second critical point, again, we see that the function is increasing. The slope is positive, so the derivative is positive. In between critical point 2 and critical point 3, we see that the slope is negative. The function is decreasing, so the derivative is negative. And in between uh, the last critical point and that endpoint B, we see again that the function is increasing. In other words, the derivative is positive. Okay, so now I want to think about where the extreme values are. And the obvious ones that are extreme values are c sub 2 and c sub 3. Those are very clearly uh, local extrema. Uh, this first one here, c sub 2, would be a local maximum and c sub 3 would be a local minimum. Okay. Further, if we look at the endpoints, we can see that b looks to be a local max, and at a, we uh, seem to have a local min. The one that isn't a local min or a local max is c sub 1. This one is pretty clearly neither, right? I can't call it a local max because just to the right it's increasing, and so there'll be a point greater. I can't call it a local min because just to the left I'll have a point that's less than. So c sub 1 is kind of left out in the cold. And so the question is why do you know some of these critical points, why do some of these critical points represent a min or a max, whereas there's one that clearly doesn't? I want to look to my sign chart for a little bit of guidance here. In order for something to be a min or a max, what has to be happening is that to the left of that point, the function, let's think about a max first. For a point to be a maximum value, to the left of that point, the function had to be increasing everywhere. And then past that point, the function has to be decreasing. So that that point at which you're in between increasing and decreasing is in fact a maximum. For a minimum value, I need to be decreasing to the left and increasing to the right. And so I can see that for c sub 2 and c sub 3, I have those situations. My derivative is positive to the left of c sub 2, which means the function was increasing. It's 0 at c sub 2 and then starts decreasing. So at c sub 2, I'm going to have a relative max. Taking a look at the interval to the left of c sub 3, I can see here that the derivative is negative. So the function is decreasing all the way up until we get to c sub 3. And then past c sub 3, the derivative is positive, so the function was increasing. So if I've been decreasing everywhere to the left, at least on that interval to the left, and then all of a sudden start increasing past, I must be at a relative min. In that area, this is going to be the lowest value. 
However, at C sub 1, I have neither of those situations arising. In fact, the derivative is not changing from either a negative to a positive, meaning going from decreasing to increasing, or the other way around, going from increasing to decreasing. To the left of C sub 1, my derivative is positive, so the function is increasing, and it remains increasing to the right. So just by looking at my sign chart, I can clearly tell that C sub 1 is not going to be a relative uh, extrema and uh, won't be an absolute one uh, as well. So notice that the sign chart that we constructed really gives me all of the information to determine whether a critical point or an endpoint is an extrema. Now I don't know whether it's going to be an absolute extrema or not. I still need to actually test that out by plugging in the uh, particular critical uh, value, C1, C2, or C3, uh, back into my function to determine you know, which of those extrema would be the absolute max or the absolute min. The last thing to, di um, to dis uh, discuss a little bit is the endpoints. So notice that A and B were both um, relative extrema, A being a relative min and B being a relative max. And we know that an endpoint is where the function ends. So if you consider a left endpoint, think about a point to the left. What would make it a minimum value? Well, it would be a minimum value if everywhere to the right the function is increasing, as we see here. For a right endpoint, we know a function would be a maximum value if everywhere to the left the function were increasing, and vice versa. Right? A left endpoint would be a maximum if everywhere to the right the function were decreasing. And a right endpoint would be a minimum if everywhere to the left the function were decreasing. And so this is essentially the first derivative test. Um, all you have to do is create the sign chart of your derivative. And based on all of the information in the sign chart, you can make a decision on whether that critical point um, is going to be an extrema or not. So, of course, this is going to be incredibly useful, and uh, now what we want to do is put it into um, really clear language so that we know exactly um, what the derivative test says and then also how to execute it. Before we get right into the language of the derivative test, I want to point out this um, helpful graph here. So if you take a look on this is actually on page 211 of your textbook, it gives you all of the possible scenarios that you could have um, when looking at a graph and tells you whether it's going to be an absolute min, local min, local max, and, or whether there's going to be no extreme value. And you can clearly see the same relationship that we talked about. Whenever there's no extreme value, you notice that the derivative to the left and the derivative to the right are going to have the same value. You know, here they're increasing on both sides. Here the derivative is negative on both sides. The function is decreasing to the left and to the right. And you can also see an example of a point where the function is undefined. I'm sorry, the derivative is undefined. Remember, that's still a critical point. Um, and so we're still looking at whether the derivative is going from positive to negative, as it is in this case, or potentially going from negative to positive to decide whether it's going to be a relative extrema. So you don't necessarily need to copy this down in your notes. You can if you find it particularly helpful, but I wanted to point that out. All right, so here is the first derivative test. Now, this is uh, taken right out of your textbook, page 211, and continues on to page 212. So what you want to do is copy this down into your notes um, it seems tedious, but it will be worthwhile because you need to have this totally memorized. And this is also something that you certainly want to capture in your um, key term study guide sheet. Uh, however, I would suggest first copying it down into your notes, and then you can more succinctly capture it um, in your uh, key terms packet. But I'm going to go over them briefly here uh, just to make sure there's no uh, as, as few questions as possible. So uh, the first derivative test goes as follows. And uh, in each situation here, I'm talking about a continuous function f of x. So at a critical point c, 
you have really one of three possibilities. First possibility, if the derivative changes sign from positive to negative at that particular critical point, then f has a local maximum value at that critical point. Here are two uh, examples. The function is increasing to the left, decreasing to the right, increasing to the left, decreasing to the right. That means that critical point will be where a local maximum occurs. Now, it could be an absolute maximum. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Notice that these are the two possible values of critical points, meaning a critical point that makes the derivative zero, also a critical point that makes the derivative undefined. The second possibility, if the derivative changes sign from negative to positive, then f has a local minimum value at that critical point. Here, the derivative is negative to the left, meaning the function is decreasing to the left. Derivative is positive to the right, meaning the function increases to the right. Hence, I have a local minimum at that value c. And here, the derivative, even though it's undefined at c, to the left is negative, so the function is decreasing, and positive to the right, so the function is increasing. One quick note here is that this blue graph is representing the function f, and so what we're saying is since the, the function is decreasing, uh, the derivative is less than zero, so on and so forth for all the others. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the third possibility. So the third option is that the derivative does not change sign at that critical point, and as we've seen examples of, that means there's going to be no local extreme value at c. Here are again two examples. Uh, the function is increasing to the left, continues increasing to the right. Um, the derivative is positive on both sides of that critical point. Here the derivative is decreasing to the left, continues decreasing to the right, so the derivative would be negative on both sides of that critical point. That will lead me to have no extreme value. All right, last we want to consider what the first derivative test tells us with regards to the left and right endpoints. So let's consider the left endpoint first, and this should make sense from our discussion previously. So if the derivative is less than zero, and since this is a left endpoint, we're considering what the derivative is to the right of that endpoint. So if the derivative is less than zero uh, to the right of that endpoint A, then f is going to have a local maximum. If the derivative is greater than zero, then the function is going to have a local minimum. And here you can see the two situations. Derivative to the right of a is less than zero. That means that point is a local max, and vice versa. At the right end point, I have pretty much the opposite. So remember, at the right end point, I can only consider the derivative to the left so if the derivative is less than zero to the left of this right endpoint, meaning the function is decreasing, then I will have a local min. And if the derivative is positive, meaning the function is increasing to the left of that right endpoint, then I have a local max. So these are all the cases that are taken care of of the first derivative uh, in the first derivative test. And it allows us to succinctly and efficiently determine whether a critical point or an endpoint will be a local extrema. Of course, we still need to make sure that we're testing for any absolute extrema. And so we're going to now go over the protocol for utilizing the first derivative test uh, to determine the extrema of a function. All right, so we want to make sure we have a clear protocol for using the first derivative test to determine and classify the extrema of the function. So determine, just figure out where those extrema occur and classify to state whether, meaning to state whether a, an extrema is a local or an absolute, um, sorry, I should say local or global, or relative or absolute um, extrema of the function. So if we're given a function f, we want to find the extrema of the function. We first want to take the derivative of f, the derivative is what's going to allow us to use the first derivative test, obviously. We want to determine the critical points. Of course, the points, uh, the critical points are the uh, x values that make the derivative 0 or the derivative undefined. We then want to create a sign chart 
for our derivative, and we should include the endpoints if they're given. Remember, the sign chart has all the critical points on it, and we should include the endpoints if they're given. That way we don't forget to test them, um, because remember, a, an extrema will occur either at a critical point or at an endpoint. So those are the points that we need to test. And this is really the key step here, creating the sign chart. The sign chart holds so much information about both our function and the derivative and is what allows us to use the first derivative test very quickly. So give, with our sign chart, we're then going to uh, check the criteria of the first derivative test for each of these critical points and endpoints in order to determine which of those points are going to be a relative, or I could say local, extrema. So once I've identified which points are a relative extrema, I can then evaluate the original function at these critical points and endpoints, the ones that I've identified from step four, to determine whether there's an absolute extrema, right? Which one has you know, either the, the greatest or the smallest value out of all of them? And also to determine the specific values for each of the relative extrema. Okay? Important to remember that this is reevaluating with the original function because I'm trying to determine the extrema of this function f. One uh, thing that I want to mention is this. We spent a good deal of time um, finding extrema of functions uh, by first looking at the graph and identifying, you know, where do, we, um, where do we think the extrema are going to occur? And that way, when we went to find our critical points, we knew what we were looking for. That's still a really good idea. And so I still recommend, either at the beginning or if you're pressed for time, you can do this at the end if you have the time, would be to use a graphical representation. The graphical representation is just going to give you a visual um, of what it is that you're finding analytically using these five steps. Let's go ahead and apply this now um, to find and classify the extrema of a function. All right, we're going to take a look at two functions here. You should try doing each on your own first. Just follow that protocol. Um, and uh, you might you know, run into a couple speed bumps along the way, but that'll ultimately be more beneficial to you. So go ahead and run through this. Uh, first on your own, and then we'll take a look. Alright, the first thing that I want to do here uh, in identifying the local um, extrema and any absolute extrema is probably to take a look at the graph. This is a cubic function, so I can visualize that in my head, actually. Uh, you know, a cubic function with a positive leading coefficient is going to decrease uh, as uh, x approaches negative infinity and increase as x approaches positive infinity. So, you know, it'll look something like this. And so with that in mind, I know I'm, you know, probably looking for a couple of um, relative uh, extrema. So let's go ahead and find the derivative here. The derivative of f using uh, the power rule on each term. You can get 3x squared minus 12. And just to go along with what we discussed in the protocol, this, of course, would be the first step. Secondly, I want to identify any critical points, so I'm going to set my derivative equal to zero, solve for x, and I'm also going to check any points where it's undefined. So setting it equal to zero, I can do this um, from this first step here and just notice what will make uh, this function go to zero. In other words, what will make 3x squared equal 12. Um, and that's clearly when, it's, when I'm going to have 3 times 4, and x squared will be 4 when x is either 2 or negative 2. But if not, I could factor out a 3. I could look at this term. That would make it a little more clear. If I'm still unsure, I can always use the quadratic formula or just solve using inverse operations by setting this specific term equal to 0. But when I do that, I will get that x is equal either positive or negative 2. So those are critical points. Now, there's nothing that will make a polynomial undefined, so these are going to be my critical points. Now I'm going to be able to create my sign chart for my derivative. And of course, my sign chart is going to be made up um, considering the critical points and then looking at um, the intervals in between those critical points. So those are the only critical points that I have. Remember, this chart is telling me the sign of f prime. But I also want to make sure that it's uh, referring to each of these critical points as what the value of f prime is at each of these critical points, which of course is 0. If it were undefined, I could label that as well. And there are no endpoints that are defined here, so this function goes on to negative and positive infinity. 
So now I'm going to evaluate the sign of my derivative in these intervals that I do not know the sign of the derivative in yet. So to the left of negative 2, I can use uh, negative 3. Negative 3 squared is going to be 9. 3 times 9 is 27. Minus 12 is going to be a positive value. In between negative 2 and 2, I can use 0. I always want to use 0 if I can. 0 squared is 0. Minus 12 It's going to give me a negative value. And then to the right of 2, I can use 3. And since I use negative 3 and I'm squaring that value, I can uh, just refer to the value I already found for negative 3. 3 squared, 9 times 3 is 27, minus 12. It's going to be positive. All right, at this point, I have a lot of information, and I can use all of this information that's captured in my sign chart to look at my first derivative test and determine which of these critical points um, are going to be a local or uh, relative extrema. So remember, the criteria are that either I need to be going from the derivative needs to be changing from positive to negative, or it needs to be changing from negative to positive. That will tell me that there's going to be an extrema there at a critical point. So notice here that my derivative is changing from positive, meaning it was increasing. It's, the derivative is 0 at negative 2, which flattens out, and then begins decreasing afterwards. So this, if I check my first derivative test, when the derivative goes from positive to negative, that means that at that critical point, I'm going to have a local maximum. So I want to go ahead and label that as such. Then looking at positive 2, I have another situation where the derivative is changing sign. Here it is going from negative or decreasing to then positive, which means this is going to be a relative minimum. At this point, I've identified all the points that are going to be extrema. And now I want to find the, um, the value of these extrema. Um, and I can also be checking for any absolute extrema. So let's first plug in the critical points that are extrema, well, since both of our critical points are extrema, we'll just substitute both back into our function. All right, so plugging uh, these critical points that I've determined are an extrema of the function back into my function to determine their uh, exact values. When I plug in negative 2 uh, into my original function, I get a value of 11. And since I identified this as a relative maximum, I can say that the function f has a relative maximum value of 11 at x equals negative 2. So you want to go ahead and write that out. I'll say that one more time. The function f has a relative maximum of 11 when x equals negative 2. Similarly, for positive 2, I know that that is a relative minimum. And so when I find that f of 2 is negative 21, I can say that my function f has a relative minimum at negative 20 of negative 21 at x equals 2. This is the, you know, corresponds to the point uh, 2 comma negative 21. Now, I want to classify any absolute extrema. If I am going to quickly think about the way that my function looks graphically, and you can graph this out quickly on your calculator as well, what you'll notice is that you're going to get something that looks like this. Okay? Now, it's going on forever and ever to the right and to the left, decreasing to the left and increasing to the right. The points that we discovered, negative 2 and 2, correspond to these points here. Right? relative min uh, maximum here at negative 2, and a relative minimum here at positive 2. Probably should have drawn this more to scale. But what you can see here is that neither of these points are going to be an absolute extrema. Okay? And that's important to consider. So for this function, a cubic function, you can sort of visualize it, um, but you may want to get in the habit of graphing just to check and make sure that your conclusions are correct. All right, let's take a look at one more. All right, so here's another function, g of x, uh, which is e to the x times x squared minus 3. So uh, on your own here, go ahead and work through the protocol that we described for finding the local extrema and identifying any absolute extrema. I would recommend, when you're all done, taking a look at the graph uh, to confirm your findings. And then go ahead and take a look. We'll go through the solution quickly. The first thing I do is take the derivative of my function. Here I'm using the product rule. And so I have the first uh, function, e to the x, times the derivative of the second. And then I'm adding to it the derivative of the first function. Derivative e to the x is just e to the x, times the second, x squared minus 3. I want to try and factor this because I know I'm going to set it equal to 0. So I'm going to factor out an e to the x. And then I'm going to end up with 2x plus x squared minus 3 left over. So I can write that as x squared plus 2x minus 3. And then I can actually factor this quadratic x plus 3 
x minus 1. Now I'm ready to go ahead and find the critical points where the derivative is equal to 0 or where it's undefined. So setting my derivative equal to 0, I can see that uh, this will be equal to 0 only when x plus 3 is equal to 0, when uh, x equals 3, and when x minus 1 is equal to 0, which is when x equals 1, e to the x will never equal 0. Uh, also, g prime will never be undefined, uh, because e to the x will never be undefined, and neither will any of these. So my only two critical points are x equals negative 3 and x equals 1. So now I can go ahead and create my uh, sign chart for the derivative and identify my relative extrema. All right, constructing my sign chart here with my two critical points where the derivative is 0, I can uh, substitute in some values to the left of negative 3, determine that the derivative is positive to the left of negative 3, can substitute in 0 to my derivative, find the derivative is negative in between negative 3 and 1, and then substitute in a value to the right of 1 to find that my derivative is positive. Looking at my sign chart and using my first derivative test, I know that my function is going from increasing to decreasing, so negative 3 will be a point where there is a relative maximum, and when I switch from decreasing to increasing in my derivative, that will be a point where my function g has a, is at a relative min. So I can now go through and define exactly what those values are and decide if there are any absolute minimums or absolute maximums. All right, so I've determined the value of my function when x is 3. I get 2 point, uh, 0.299, or about 0.3. And g of 1 is approximately negative 0.54. So uh, there's going to be a minimum here and a maximum here. And there are no other points that are competing with this. So I might want to say that this is an absolute max and this is an absolute min. But to do that, I need to actually uh, visualize what's happening in my function uh, to make sure there are no other points that will be either lower than 5.4 or greater than 0.299. So let's actually think about this function here. Um, what's going to happen as I go further out to the right, further out to the left? So as I move closer to positive infinity, I'm going to have e to a very big number, a very big number squared minus 3. It's going to be a very, very big number. So I can sort of tell that the limit as, I, as x approaches infinity is going to be infinity. As I approach, uh, as x approaches negative infinity, here I'm going to have e to the very big negative number, which is actually going to be getting closer and closer to 0. So I can sort of ascertain that as I move towards the left, my function will be getting closer to 0. Let's confirm by looking at the graph. So looking here at my function, I can see the critical values that I'm referring to. So here would be negative 3 and positive 1, I'm down here. So I can pretty clearly see that while this is a relative maximum, it's not going to be an absolute maximum because my function is increasing everywhere to the right. And so there's going to be some value, many values in fact, that are going to be greater than this. But in this neighborhood, it is the maximum, so it's a relative max. However, at x equals 1, this is an absolute minimum, because when we think about the function moving towards negative infinity, this is always going to be positive, but it's going to be getting closer and closer to 0, because e to the x approaches 0 as x approaches negative infinity. So negative 3 will be a relative maximum, and positive 1 will be an absolute minimum. At this point, go ahead and complete uh, homework 4.04. Make sure to uh, follow through and complete all of them. Show your work, and if you need a hint, don't uh, forget to click on the hint button uh, on the app. Those can be really helpful. And if you still need help, make sure to send me an email.